the most fundamental element of the agenda, though, for both sides, is that uh, we have uh, an extraordinarily important bilateral relationship that right now has a lot of stress points in it. And this past year has seen more downs than ups uh, as we bounce through the year. Uh, I think both presidents want to set a clear framework for this relationship, uh, articulate uh, why it is important for both of us uh, and what we should expect to try to get out of it and what are the principles that we should be looking at as we move forward in this relationship. I think that's especially important because the people in China are going to be reading that. It's important for the Chinese president to frame the relationship in ways that differ from those of the most ardent nationalists in China who have had a lot of access to the media over the past year. China uh, has now become a big enough economy with a big enough military that it is now seen universally as a country of global impact. Uh, but it still is, in Chinese eyes, fundamentally a developing country. It still ranks below number 100 on the list of countries by per capita GDP. Uh, they see their problems fundamentally as moving out of poverty, getting more people into the modern sector of their economy, and coping with all of the problems that developing countries have, uh, you know, disease and social instability and so forth. Uh, so uh, while they are a country with a global impact, I think it's quite clear they're not yet global players. Uh, they see themselves fundamentally as a developing country that needs to focus, first of all, on its own development. But others see China as a country that should step up to global responsibilities on global problems. Uh, and I think that's very much the U.S. hope, that China will be a responsible global player. Uh, there's a disconnect there, or at least uh, others feel that China is able to do more than China has decided that it can do. And so there's an inevitable undercurrent of tension over that issue. I hope that this summit will uh, create uh, I guess, better mutual understanding of what the possibilities are and how best to do as much as China can do, to get them to do as much as they can do on these major global issues, because their role in these will be quite important if they can get a consensus to move ahead on them. The Korean Peninsula is the single scariest unknown as we look forward to the coming year or two. Uh, the odds are it'll muddle through okay. Uh, but there are two huge dangers there. One is the potential for massive instability in North Korea. They are going through a succession there as a kind of regime that inherently has trouble with succession. Uh, there's no regularized process that makes this work, and it's a system under tremendous stress. If the North Korean regime should fundamentally collapse, uh, frankly, we have not coordinated to the extent we should have with China, uh, South Korea hasn't coordinated with China to the extent it should have. Let me say the onus for that lack of coordination is on the Chinese side. We have sought to do it. The South Koreans have sought to do it. The Chinese are so worried that North Korea would learn about that kind of consultation and react extremely badly to it that they've been too cautious to engage in it at a meaningful level. That's a big problem because if there is massive instability in North Korea, we're going to be engaged, South Korea will be engaged, China will be engaged, and we will not have worked it out ahead of time. This stuff is very hard to do on the fly and do it right. Second big issue is one that the Obama administration has begun to raise very clearly to China, among others. And that is, we now estimate that North Korea could well have a nuclear-capable missile that can reach the United States within five years. Uh, that changes the nature of the North Korean nuclear program from a U.S. perspective. It's no longer simply a regional threat. It is now a direct threat to the U.S. homeland. That means we must respond to it. Uh, so if China isn't more effective in, in containing the North Korean nuclear program, China can anticipate a more robust U.S. military uh, approach to containing that program itself. I don't mean strikes against North Korea, but it's going to draw more U.S. forces, anti-missile systems and that kind of thing, to this issue. Uh, China doesn't want that, but China has to confront the fact that this is now a core U.S. interest. One of the areas that, despite ups and downs over the past year, has continued to move forward is U.S.-China cooperation on clean energy. Uh, this is really a major opportunity for both sides. Our capabilities are relatively complementary. Uh, this is a, 
an economic sector that is primed for enormous growth uh, in the coming years. Everyone accepts that at this point. Uh, and it is clearly the case that the companies on both sides can move ahead more rapidly in development, deployment, scaling up of full commercialization of new clean energy technologies if we can work together, government to government, private sector to private sector, and public-private partnerships uh, than if we try to do th these things wholly on our own.